So can we start now? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can we start now? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone to the um, um, seminar series of uh, trustworthy data science and AI. Today, we are extremely happy to have Professor Ehab uh, Elias um, from uh, University of Waterloo to uh, give us a talk. Ehab is a professor in the uh, Chariton uh, School of Computer Science and the Anser Thompson Reuters Research Chair on Data Quality at the University of uh, Waterloo. His main research focuses on the areas of big data and database systems with special inches in data quality and integration, managing uncertain data, machine learning for data curation and information extraction. He is a co-founder of uh, TAMU, a startup focusing on large scale data integration. And he is also the co-founder of Inductive, um, acquired by Apple last year uh, in Mac News. And uh, uh, which is a Waterloo based startup on using AI for structured data cleaning. He is the uh, uh, recipient of the Ontario Early Researcher Award, um, Chariton um, Faculty Fellowship, and Answer Discovery Accelerator Award, and a Google Faculty Award. And congratulations to Ihab, he is an ACM Fellow. So uh, thank you very much for um, sparing the time to talk to us. We really look forward to that. Now, uh, let me uh, please take the stage. Thank you, Jianpei. Uh, and thank, thank you, Tian Zhang and Jinan for, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and SFU has been always have this uh, special place in my heart. It is the first Canadian school that I visited ever. Uh, that was very long time ago, and uh, I'm very happy that I give uh, a talk here. Um, so I'm gonna today. I'm gonna spend some time telling you uh, not one but two systems that we have been working on uh, in the last few years: um, uh, Holoclean and Camino. And uh, hopefully, I get you intrigued about this idea of structure prediction, and we will, with a hint of privacy that I'm gonna talk about later. Uh, in the in the talk, uh, so basically you probably have seen this uh, before, especially if you're interested in trustworthy trustworthiness of data or data quality. That all what we want is to go from uh, data that is acquired by some ingest box and uh, push it in some analytic pipeline, and then we get insights and reports uh, and and valuable information that can either lead businesses or make decisions. And you heard it so many times about how much manual labeling and, and effort and labor work is, uh, is invested in, in making this data better and, um, and higher quality and just pushing robustness to the machine learning models uh, to handle noise, although it works pretty well in most of the time in, in unstructured domains and, and media domains, uh, like videos and text and, and, and images because of the redundancy, uh, these robustness, these robust models usually fail uh, for uh, purely structured data, the boring structured data uh, that are usually very heterogeneous um, and very sparse and doesn't enjoy the same redundancy set. So errors make a lot of problems there. There is a lot of, this domain has a lot of support from, uh, from industry and academia. Uh, building machine learning models and data pipelines and machine learning SysML kind of infrastructure and data integration structure to be able to do things like schema mapping and dedupe and error detection. Uh, and Gartner called the data prep quadrant, uh, where you prepare the data to feed into your models. But why data prep still did not enjoy the same explosion in tooling that uh, machine learning provisioning enjoyed? So a few years back to ask a student to build the machine learning model to do simple tasks, it requires some expertise. Uh, but last, last year, my grade 11 uh, uh, daughter uh, with her friends who had no expertise in machine learning spent few weeks and then they built a model for 
analyzing pollution and taking some um, some uh, metrics on cars and 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 um, and routes and to predict the most polluted routes because they were interested in in a machine learning model to help the environment. And it was that easy. It was uh, XG boost with some PyTorch and and things were amazing. Um, but the same thing we cannot say about data cleaning systems, still extremely labor intensive and extremely costly. The reason is probably, uh, I usually give this example of a very toy um, uh, uh, data set uh, that looks like a table and looks structured and nice, but it's really full of errors. It's full of duplicates, value syntactic errors, uh, missing values, and a little bit more on a deeper level, what we call integrity constraint violations. And you know, GNN has done tons of work in, in pretty much all aspects of those. Um, and data cleaning or data prep is nothing but fixing these errors. So you try to deduplicate the data and uh, probably impute some missing values if you can, uh, correct some syntactic errors. So when you ask about how many people in New York, you don't get it wrong. And if you are lucky, you can even fix integrity constraint violation to make sure that the zip code determines the city. So you don't have to uh, rows that agree on the zip code that they do not agree in the city. That's just not okay. So let's take one of these problems that are kind of uh, uh, the oldest data prep problem, which is deduplicating uh, the data. So you start by the table and uh, you start by building some sort of a similarity metrics to generate a lot of pairs. And then you take these pairs and you try to cluster them somehow because um, you know similar pairs that are too similar um, it might transitively lead into generating of clusters of multiple representation of the same real world entity. And you would like to say actually P1 and P2 and P5 are all the same person. They are all Mr. Green uh, and they are just um, different mentions at different time. And then if you succeeded in getting these uh, duplicates narrowed down into clusters, you, you need to play some black magic in, in merging those and in what we call the data fusion problem in, or record fusion problem in which you find the canonical representation of every cluster. And the reason I'm saying black magic there because it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pseudo uh, for domain expertise. What do I do with height? What do I do with income? Uh, how to um, you know, have a canonical representation of name or stuff like that. So it's a simple problem. It's some, you know, we, we, we give it to uh, many of our students to, and, and, and colleagues to play with. As you can say, it's just a self-join with a cluster and some uh, transformations. But uh, what is machine learning into this? Why, why ML cannot help there? ML is, has been in this problem forever. And, uh, and uh, it has been limited to generating these uh, numbers that you see here, this 0 0.9, 0 0.3. This is basically probability of a match or a distance or a similarity. It depends how you wanna call it. But to do this, you teach a very easy classifier uh, that work on pairs of thingies, in this case, pairs of records, uh, you generate a feature vector for these uh, people and, uh, uh, and then you run uh, a classifier and you say what's match and what's not matching by showing it a lot of examples. And here you can be as modern as you want, either feature engineering, like you know, 10 years old machine learning, or you put this into some you know, representation layer in which you embed these strings in some uh, 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 low dimensional, uh, dimensionality kind of representation and you schmooze them together into an aggregated contextual representation that allows you to compare, for example, the embedding of the first record to the embedding of the second record and so on. But the, the classification problem is still easy enough. It's judging if two things are the same or not. So what's the problem then? Well, the problem is even something simple like this, and this is kind of a, what somebody like Tamer would do, would require a very sophisticated uh, pipeline. This is only 10% of the back end of, of Tamer, for example, in which you take the source data, you need to find a way to generate pairs that are candidate for this process. Then you do feature vector or, or representation. And oftentimes you need to involve humans, especially for uh, uh, tail domains and things that are not very well known. So you engage in an active learning loop, which is this uh, orange piece uh, in which you keep showing people uh, kind of hard cases. Then you graduate a model, then you run the model on the whole data set. Then you take all the label pairs and you cluster it, then you validate the clusters and so on. And even if you get all of these right, um, then you, you have a, 
you have a problem with the N square explosion in, in this candidate generation in which um, the community has lots of interesting papers around using locality sensitive hashing schemes, for example, for blocking. So I avoid comparing everything to everything else. Uh, and, and again, uh, in this audience, there is you know, experts in prefix filtering and, and, other, uh, and other techniques that allowed us to do uh, this in a much, much uh, better way. So what's the problem then? We can do DDoP. Um, the problem is there is other data um, problems that kind of make it a lot harder to do prep, especially if the, if the downstream is ML. Although we teach in our uh, database classes uh, nulls and null uh, logic and three-valued logic and, and so on, and it's, it's really hard to find null in practice. It's, it's often replaced by question marks and ask John and ask uh, Jinan and, and, and ranges and stuff like that. And you need to clean that mess to be able to even realize that I don't know uh, the, the, the price. So that's, that's the kind of topic of what I'm trying to say today, that there are... Uh, uh, two classes of what I call data cleaning problems, and they are distinct in their uh, set of challenges. Data unification set of things, it's a combinatorial problem. I need to compare everything to everything else, like multi-class classification and deduplication and schema mapping and so on, hierarchical classification, sorry. But there is another class uh, that's called data, I call it data cleaning for the lack of better terms, that, that really would like to spot errors and violations in the actual, at the instance level, and trying to propose repairs for this data. The reason they are distinct, the first one, the machine learning problem itself is kind of easy. It's a classification of two things. And the problem there is engineering, scale, data store, uh, and querying. So it's really in our, um, in, in the data, for the database community, for example, it's in kind of our backyard. For the data cleaning, uh, you know, the problem is you need a huge context to be able to have a very complex classification problem. For example, what is the most probable value for this? So you, you can get multi-class classification or regression and the context in which you feed that problem is not understood um, uh, exactly. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. So we wanted in you know, a few years back to automate data cleaning, move away from rule-based methods, which was dominating industry, and it, it has this uh, rule, rule explosion problem, because whenever you find an edge case, you add a rule. Whenever you find an edge case, you add a rule. And the number of rules that you need to maintain is bigger than the, the data itself. Plus, we don't know how to combine a lot of signals. So the statistical uh, signals, plus some business rules, some, plus some domain expertise. And oftentimes, people needed confidence in this decision, such that they can vet it, or they can uh, put a priority on showing it to humans. So machine learning give you all that because you know it's a melting pot and you can add all of these signals as prior and you don't have to explicitly have rules to maintain and you probably can generate confidence. But we need to solve a bunch of other problems. Because of the sparsity of the data and, and, and heterogeneity of the data, the background knowledge became extremely important to be modeled explicitly in the model, in the data cleaning machine. And you need to be able to learn from very few to no non-existing training data. For example, if you're looking for errors, you don't have millions of errors, you have few examples of errors, and you'd like to generate a machine that find all of these errors, which put a lot of pressure on kind of vanilla supervised machine learning models. And then if you get all of that, you need to worry about scale and provision something that will work for trillion sources, trillion um, uh, records, uh, data that's changing all the time. So you cannot really have three weeks uh, time to train a model to, 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 to do one data set that is changing every day. So in 2016 and early 17, we started a project called Holoclean. And it was really a, a humble attempt to take all previous work that we have done in, in uh, mining constraints and uh, rule-based data cleaning and, and integrity constraint, uh, uh, mining and repair, and put it into uh, one melting pot, which is handling or uh, presenting machine learning, um, data cleaning, error detection, error repair as a pure inference model. And we use all the tools and structure prediction to model the data set and contextually represent uh, what we see in a data set to use it to predict a task like if a cell is wrong or, or right, or what is the most probable value for this missing city 
or what is the most most probable genre for this song or what is the most probable uh, country uh, of birth for the singer and all of uh, these uh, can be seen as a cleaning of data prep the underlying principle was 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 kind of easy and published that in ICDT 2019 which is the noisy channel model we assumed that the data was generated uh, by some model by some intention model as a clean data set and then it went into kind of a noise generator, a realizer that added noise and mess with this data, adding, uh, you know, uh, uh, obscuring some value, adding uh, some violations, updates, and so on. And then what you see is JSTAR is a, a polluted version of the data set that wasn't intent to look like that, but it's polluted. And then the idea is data cleaning is nothing but um, identifying the most probable instance I that maximize the probability of what you're seeing. So that's kind of the, would be the most probable clean instance that justifies why I'm seeing the current dirty instance. So although this is hard, uh, we start to parameterize these models and trying to, you know, making a learning problem. So if we parameterize the generator, this I, this I process, uh, and if we parameterize the, the noise generator and start to try to estimate these parameters, these models, I probably can make this as an inference problem where the I, the instance I that I'm looking for is, is nothing but um, uh, the instance or the world or the database that uh, maximize the probability of observing the dirty data set. So we're going, we got, you know, it, 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 it's the, the details is not that important, but here is an example of what a generative model look like in which we have KI is, uh, probability, for example, for every tuple, it's like the prior, uh, what is the probability of seeing a tuple? And then you assume that there is a bunch of constraints or business rules that, um, that dictate how values can, can exist together. Um, think about it like functional dependencies, denial constraints, uh, HR rules, whatever you like. And uh, Ws are the weights of these things. And then, um, you know, if, you, if I borrow a model from the exponential family, then the probability of any instance i is, uh, you can see it's kind of the multiplication of these uh, prior probability with an exponential term that penalize the violations of rules. So these v is the number of violations uh, that you have in your instance. And basically you'd like to give a, you know, a slap on, on the hand for an instance that have too many violations and a brownie point for an instance that do not have violations. And, and that's how you induce a probability distribution of the space of possible values or the space of possible instances. So if you have a probability distribution such that, what is the probability that I see this table? What is the probability that I see that table? Uh, I probably can choose the one that have the highest probability. So, you know, what, what is that has to do with all the previous work and, you know, two, three decades of, uh, of data cleaning? Well, we need somehow a way to represent these integrity constraints that makes the data good data. So uh, more than a decade ago, multiple papers um, uh, talked about how to use denial constraints in cleaning. And, and, I, and I recall this particular one that I liked quite a bit, um, consistent query answering using denial constraints by Jan Kaminsky. And, um, and uh, there is also uh, work with LAX uh, in, in, that, in, in that area. Uh, but in general, it's a first order logic formula that allow you to talk about um, the impossibility of some uh, conjuncts uh, of conditions. So for example, I can say you cannot have two employees, uh, you know, you cannot have T alpha and T beta, uh, which is two employees in which they agree on the city, but they do not agree on the state. So here it is, I told you a function dependency that city determines state. But I can also say things like you cannot have two employees in the same role, one of them in New York City, the other one is not in New York City, and the New York City person is making less money. You can't have that. It's a business rule and I will, it will be a violation. So the idea is to take these things and try to represent it in a model uh, that allow you to do uh, this reasoning. I'm gonna skip this just to tell you that if you're not interested in tabular data and you are into the knowledge graphs and, and RDF data, then a parallel universe uh, exists. These pattern constraints and shackle constraints are constraints also tell you uh, what's possible and what's not possible in an instance of a property graph, for example. So now we have all the ingredients. We would like to say, okay, I have a, a model that tells me what is the probability of observing a data set. 
I have a bunch of constraints that tell you what's right and what's wrong. And the idea is now to build a machine learning model uh, to, uh, to learn the importance of these uh, constraints, learn the parameters of the model, and then I use that model for prediction. In the original HoloClean paper in 2017, it was kind of conceptual model. It's a graphical model in which uh, every cell in the database uh, is, a, is, a, is a random variable. And these constraints that I was telling you about is factors that tell you how the values of these random variables depend on each other. So for example, um, the city and the zip of two tuples, T1 and T4, are four random variables. And there is a factor that kind of guide what kind of possible values these four values can take, uh, four cells can take, such that it has low probability if it violates an integrity constraint. Uh, so you take like you know a, ne a negative uh, a negative weight, and uh, if you don't take uh, and a positive weight if you do not violate that constraint. So that's how we influence um, increase the probability of good words, uh, good good databases, uh, and uh, decrease the probability of bad. Uh, violating databases. Uh, without going in, the, you know, the HoloClean paper goes through a lot of uh, optimizations and looking for local optimal because apparently, you know, running inference on these kind of generic uh, graph structures is is a really really hard problem. Uh, and um, um, but the insight was if we look for local observations around what's currently observed, the problem can be uh, uh, modeled uh, with huge approximation, but modeled into a kind of just pure logistic regression at the end where every factor uh, involves only one random variable and then it becomes just features. So that was cool because we tried uh, basically, you know, this picture tells you the value that this tuple T1 city depends on, did I see this address uh, anywhere else or not? Does it conflict with the already existing data or not? And so on. So the features of, uh, of a cell, if every cell in the database is a random variable, the feature basically models statistical co-occurrence with other values in the database and also any violations that this value can induce. And that's how you, uh, for all the possible values that of city, you start to pick the one that maximize this probability. In, in uh, uh, later, uh, we, we started to put this in a more functional model in which we, you know, we we start to have um, the AIMNet model in in MLSS, and the idea again is is simple. We start by uh, learning, and uh, uh, you, you know, imagine you take a, a table, and then for every uh, row, uh, uh, you're interested in a target attribute that you would like to predict. For example, I see city and address and name and country, and I'd like to predict salary, or I'd like to predict. A country of birth. And then I would like to represent what I'm seeing right now. So I'd like to embed it in some space. And then the, the main thing in this analysis paper is we learn the attention, but not at the instance level, but at the schema level, which basically mimicking uh, um, uh, understanding this uh, dependency between the columns itself. So we're lifting the learning to be at the schema level. That allows us to do things like understanding that um, in this example, that uh, how important every column um, in predicting uh, some other column. So let's on the left here, you see that's, that's one row, city, country, zip, uh, code, and age. And this is the embedding space of like each value. City Chicago is embedded in a, in a five value vector, 00, zero minus 1.35 minus seven. Uh, so this is learn the embedding for the city, for the zip code, for the age. And I would like to predict the county. So the whole idea is to just build the representation for the county, given that the city and the zip and the age is as such. So the attention mechanism that you build that at the schema level can tell you how you combine these embeddings to represent a contextual representation of the missing county. So that's kind of you know, the first step, which is the representation layer. And once you have that, you say, if this is my contextual representation of the county, how close it is to all possible counties that I can take. So you build a bunch of other layers that does actual the prediction at the end, and you say, well, county A maximize the probability of seeing that context. 
versus county B. Hence, my prediction of the missing county is county A. The last layer, it takes not only the representation of the context, we add also these sparse features that I was telling you about. So we also make sure that what is the probability that county A uh, violates uh, the, the certain constraints that are observed in the data. Anyway, so if you didn't catch some of these details, and I apologize going fast, it's basically, uh, uh, I would like you to remember this picture, uh, which is, I take the database, I, uh, or, or you know, a table, I embed it in some embedding space. I learned that embedding. I learn how to combine this row together into a, one representation that kind of uh, uh, takes into account the importance of each of these columns. And I use that representation to predict what's missing in the data. So I can use this machine in a variety of ways. I can use it to impute a missing value. I can use it to predict if a value is different than what I'm currently observed. So it becomes like an error detector. Or I can I use it to predict a whole new computed column. For example, if you'd like to do um, forecasting or, or something like that. The question is how you train such model. And these models, uh, you, you know, are completely self-supervised. So we mask uh, um, what we know. So we have a lot of observed data. And basically, we build a model that um, uh, maximize the probability of reconstructing the database, giving the other things. And then you should you should jump on me and say, well, well, I, 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 I thought you're building a model to correct what's in the data. So what if the data is wrong? So building from wrong, you're going to get a wrong model. And you're absolutely right. If there is more garbage in the data than right, then the model would not be great. But under some assumptions that the, the data, the noise is not that prevalent. And if, you know, and, and there is more good than bad, uh, then in this case, um, you probably will learn the right weights. Because again, remember we're learning at the schema level. We're not learning at the, at the instance level. And, um, uh, and, and, and because there are more good than bad in the data, you're probably gonna land on an okay model. Then you can use that model to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to see what's missing and so on. So basically we graduate the model once the reconstruction error is small, but then we, we use it in production and then we measure the precision and recall and, and, um, and what have you. There's a lot of tricks, but there is you know, papers there if you're interested in the details and, and so on. Then the question was, what, what if I'm not really interested in, you know, uh, in, in really cleaning the data? I just need to know if it's correct or not. I just need to understand how trustworthy it is or how you know, erroneous it is. Do I really need to hold and go and predict and build a model that can rebuild the database? I just need a simple classifier. Given everything I see, is this particular cell, is this particular property, is it wrong? Is it fishy or is it trustworthy given it, it's consistent, it makes sense? So we thought, well, maybe we are boiling the ocean and we, what we need is a very uh, 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 complex model that takes all the signals, you know, things like for every cell, uh, you know, how prevalent it is, uh, the character level representation. Uh, so I learned some language models to represent, you know, to, to capture typos and things like that. I see how many violations every cell is, is, is participating in uh, with respect to constraint. So I build the representation layer, heavy, heavy feature uh, layer that kind of try to capture all the signals that constitute an error. And then I learn a classifier on top that is able of telling if this cell, given all of these feature, is it correct or not correct? So I need just to learn the parameters of this model. So this is the Holodetect paper in Sigma 19. The problem is now that this is by definition a supervised problem because I need examples of a lot of errors. So I keep telling this machine, here is an error. How, this is how an error look like. This is how a non-error look like. And then you learn a model that can distinguish between errors and non-errors. But errors is a very imbalanced problem. There are way, way more correct data than errors. Otherwise you are in the wrong business. And if you have tons of examples of errors, you're defeating the purpose because the whole idea is you need to find these errors. So uh, how do we go about this? Um, and one of ways that we tried in, in this paper, and it's not by no means the only way because there are other follow-up papers that did even better, is to have a few, sh few shot learning mechanism for error detection in which we observe uh, uh, or use very few 
uh, examples of errors and uh, to put it in a data augmentation machine that will generate a lot more examples of these errors. So we learn a policy, we try to learn first the model what an error look like, trying to learn the polluter itself. And that, um, uh, and we use kind of a pre-canned uh, models of generating errors, for example, transformations, swaps, uh, typos, uh, missing characters, and so on. And we use these few examples of, uh, of, uh, of uh, observed errors to uh, bias the probabilities of this transformation. And then we use that to generate a lot of errors. You are, of course, at the mercy of how uh, expressive this augmentation machine is, but then it will generate enough examples to, um, you know, by adding characters, removing character, exchange character if you're doing strings and other policies if you're doing other data types. In all cases, uh, if, you, if you manage to do this, then you build, you know, uh, you do the representation and then you're learning a very simple uh, classification problem given the feature vector um, is it correct or incorrect? Uh, we put, you know, was that thing work and why it works? Well, the good thing about this a holo clean idea and holo detect and this new way, or back in the day, new way of thinking is instead of having an error detection um, or an outlier detection uh, tool, a deduplication tool, a rule based tool, you have now one melting pot in which you fit, you add more and more featureizer, you invest in the representation layer of that model, you find a way to train it, and then you point to that machine towards structured constructs in your data, like predicting a cell or finding an error. And uh, uh, so it, it's, it's basically taking the, the best of all of these universes together in, in holistically fixing data. So we used it with a bunch of uh, uh, real world scenarios and HoloClean is led to inductive the commercial company and, and we built a commercial version of the open source one and, and it got acquired by Apple, um, which I'm, 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 um, I'm spending my time now. But this one, a use case in which we replicated uh, six months of labeling of data, for example, in 12 hours and the accuracy of reproducing these predictions this was a market research company in which they wanted to predict the right SKU for their products. And they, with some historical data, we just learn a model that can predict the right SKU uh, given integrity constraints, business rules and, and observations. And the accuracy was 97% uh, sometime. And, and even when we are different uh, than humans, sometimes or oftentimes we were better than humans. Even you know, using it for error detection when you don't know where errors are coming from, this is uh, an insurance company that classify uh, their uh, policies based on area code and, and zip codes. And uh, you know, some of those were misclassified uh, as the wrong area code. Uh, and that was important for them because it changed the premium and other things. Um, so again, by taking all of these signals into account, uh, we've been able to capture this easy, hard cases that you require lots of humans to, uh, to find it by heart, by hand. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop here and see if, you know, I uh, have any questions and maybe clarification questions or anything like that. I'm happy to stop here. It doesn't have to be like one big lecture. Um, any, any questions or clarification at this point? All good? Move on? Yeah. OK, awesome. Any, any so questions? when we solve that problem, or we imagine that we solve that problem, solve part of that problem, because you never solve data cleaning, but at least we, I think we did um, uh, you know, a, a quite serious attempt in automating uh, uh, cleaning and prep by modeling it as a, as a data prediction problem. Uh, we were faced by uh, a, a different problem. We said, okay, we, it's incomplete and dirty. Now it's uh, awesome and clean and we impute it. Uh, we started to have this privacy issues in which we really couldn't send even the data to whole, we cannot even get the data from our customer uh, because the, and, uh, even in bigger companies, um, uh, oftentimes the team that collects the data, uh, especially if it's personal sensitive data has different clearance than the team that does analytics, for example, or insights. It's, it's very different. 
And um, you cannot just ship data that has user data around, even in the same organization. Um, and, 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 and oftentimes these other teams within the same organization invent their own data to be able to release a feature or something. So we said, well, Holoclean didn't cut it because Holoclean, you know, although it cleans the data uh, by modeling how data was generated and recover errors. So that was a great opportunity, but Holoclean sits behind the firewall. It sits on this data, you clean this, uh, you know, you clean this data, you make it better. You still have to ship it somehow in a private way. So what do people do to generate a, a data or to share data in a private way? And we you know, looked at our differential privacy friends and, and colleagues who are experts and, and, and you know, the claim was DP now is a very well accepted uh, uh, concept. Census Bureau already uh, shared data uh, with differential privacy guarantees. And it's basically tell you that there are strong guarantees, statistical uh, probabilistic guarantee that you really, for a certain mechanism, you cannot tell the difference between two neighboring databases that are different in one record. Basically, it cannot say with high probability if GEMPAY is part of this database or not. And hence, this is a way to protect GEMPAY um, uh, identity. So that's pretty cool. So awesome. Let's use DP to synthesize data. Although it's a hard problem, but the differential privacy and the security community did a lot of interesting stuff there. And they have uh, GANs and other mechanisms to be able to add noise and generate uh, uh, a data set, a sample that are learned, you know, that model is learned in a private way. And then you can generate that sample. And hence that sample is a post-processing of, of the original data set, which is learned in a private way. And hence I can share it privately. Then I can give it to everybody and they do their analytics and everybody's great. The problem is uh, by definition, you're adding a lot of noise in this data. Uh, to the extent that you're destroying the underlying dependencies. So especially if you are sharing uh, structured data that has a lot of integrity constraints and functional dependencies and business rules, there is zero guarantees that these rules will carry in the synthesized, private synthesized data. And hence, very uh, questionable insights, uh, general insights. And most of these techniques are usually targeted. I'm giving you this to be able to get a, a good count or a, a good representative sample. But can you trust the deeper analytics that depends on the structure of the data is, was highly questionable. And we did some studies and it, you know, we ran Holoclean, for example, on the output of a private census data and the variance was so big, mainly because you cannot really recover the destroyed structure. Remember Holoclean job is to use the structure of the data and structure mean here, is that you know the dependency structure, not the schema, uh, the structure between you know random variables. That's the whole idea. If I if I preserve the, the structure, I can learn uh, uh, models that leverage that structure to be able to impute the data. If you destroy that structure, then uh, the data is useless from analytic perspective in certain tasks. So what the, the challenge was: can we run? Can we? You know, can we can we solve this problem? Uh, since can, can we somehow generate a private data set that preserves the structure yet enjoys the differential privacy guarantees? So we came up with Camino, uh, which built on top of Holoclean. That's why I'm presenting these two systems today. And Camino sits behind the firewall, learn a Holoclean model, the one that I just told you earlier, but learn it in a private way and sample directly from uh, this Holoclean model in a way that preserve the structure to a big extent. Uh, although, you know, I cannot claim that we have theoretical guarantees of, for example, keeping that structure uh, exactly the same, but uh, at least the number of violations of integrity constraints and dependencies should be minimized in the output and hence, although it's not super blurry data in the insights, it's way better than working with a completely butchered data set. So privately learning the data cleaning model, but repurpose it not to be a cleaning model, but to be a generative model or a, or a sampler uh, uh, is the whole idea of Camino. So the opportunity is we have a model already that although it was used for prediction and it was used for cleaning, but it learns the underlying probabilistic model. It learns the structure. 
and uh, it, its job is to observe a context and predict something that is missing. So two questions. Can we learn this model privately without compromising all the tricks that we did for efficiency? And if we manage to do this, can we use the learned model not to, not to predict anything uh, or to clean anything, but to incrementally construct a data set that came from that model? And, and the answers were not that hard in both of them. I think it, Camino is just a paper that put them together, uh, but we discovered that um, you know, it's possible. And the paper just appeared, it was in archive for a year, but then it just appeared in VLDB uh, last week or so. Given a data set D star, which is the original data set with a bunch of constraints, we'd like to generate a D prime that came from the same distribution. And the, the proxy here that uh, the number of violations of this integrity constraint in D prime is similar to the violations in D star. So you cannot tell really if, if you ran these constraints on D star or, or D prime. And it's learned in a differentially private way such that pre-processing will not allow you to, uh, sorry, post-processing will not allow you to, re to reveal if GNN or, uh, or, or GMP or, or EHAB or TNZ is, is, uh, is part of this. So I'm gonna you know, save you the details, but we leaned on uh, uh, previous results that you know, show you how to, model, to, to train a neural model in a, in a private way and how to inject, judici judiciously inject noise in, you know, the, in, in the gradient optimization step to, uh, um, uh, to learn the model in a, in a private way within a privacy budget. So that's okay. So we'll, we know how to learn HoloClean at least in a private way. The question is, can you use it to construct a sample? And um, uh, my, my, my senior student, uh, uh, Ge Chang, has, uh, has done uh, great work here. He's the, he's the main author, main driver of this paper, and showed that um, you can build a system in which you learn these models, given the private data set and the schema and the constraints. Uh, you can learn a construction uh, mechanism uh, in a private way. Uh, I'm going to skip these slides out of you know, time constraints because I'd like to keep some time for questions. But the whole idea is to, uh, if you recall, that's the probability distribution of the generative model. And again, it has two parts, the probability, prior tuple probabilities, and the weights of the violations, basically, uh, in an exponential term. Uh, but this model assumed that I observed the whole data set. So uh, Chang and, 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 and our uh, collaborators, we worked on a decomposition uh, algorithm that basically rewrite this in an incremental way, such that at any point of time, I can project these constraints and these violations on the part that is observed. So I can do it for each cell, for each row. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so it's kind of a rewrite of the whole algorithm that allow me to construct it in an iterative sampling mechanism. So I started by, you know, unlike HoloClean, I don't start by a, a, a full data set. I start by an empty data set. And then I start having, you know, put some random ages out there. And then I predict the edu num, for example, given the age. Then I predict the edu given the edu num and the age and so on. And in a raster scan, uh, such that every time I'm adding something, I'm taking into account uh, all the observed the partial sample so far, which will induce a probability distribution and it will guide me and constrain the options going forward such that when I'm done, the, uh, the data set that I constructed uh, basically would have been a, a holo clean data set or a, a data set that came from the same distribution trying to minimize violations and the constraints and all. I'm going to stop here and I would like to give a full credit first to the HoloClean team and my collaborators and, and, and my uh, students and uh, some of them, um, uh, most of them joined the company and, and uh, uh, they are currently working in Apple. Ali Reza is still uh, the second person here, is still uh, uh, in school. He did not want to join the company, but he, he's going to be on the market uh, soon and he's the one that did HoloDetect. And, um, a lot of theoretical uh, um, also results in the learnability of, of these models and how they relate to things like um, minimality of repairs and so on. And also is interested in using HoloClean in, in fusion and, and record, um, and, and, and record uh, fusion. 
uh, and my good collaborators, uh, Chris uh, and uh, Theo, uh, Mina and Josh, Omar and Ryan, were all, um, um, especially the, the lower half is all uh, uh, students in Waterloo. The Camino team is 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 um, uh, is um, very privileged to work with uh, team. It has in the middle here is she her and she's assistant professor in Waterloo and world expert in differential privacy uh, uh, and her student uh, so much are and um, and um, uh, the star is uh, Mr. Chung. Uh, he is on the market soon, so uh, hire him. He is uh, awesome and he knows uh, all about Camino. Uh, he built it from scratch and all the code and the results are uh, online. Um, so talk to him and email him if you'd like to use uh, that tool. And I think he would be more than happy to spend cycles to put it in good hands and, and show how we share data in a private way um, and use uh, structure prediction uh, to you know, work in a with sensitive data and enable analytics on sensitive data. So just to conclude, automating data cleaning infrastructure is, is, is a problem close to my heart. Uh, I think it's a you know, um, computer science complete problem. Um, we are uh, uh, in luck because we can leverage the, uh, the revolution in, in uh, scaling machine learning problem, uh, machine learning pipelines uh, and uh, good understanding of self and weak supervision uh, in, in structured domains uh, and leaning on and new thought concepts like contextual data representation and embedding models and masking and so on that allow us to deal with an old problem like this using modern techniques. And while we thought we're solving a cleaning problem, uh, we, we solved a lot of related problems in data repair and missing value imputation and prediction. And we stumbled on even uh, private data censuses as a byproduct. Um, uh, using the same uh, kind of mindset. So um, go check out Holoclean and Camino. Both are open source. Uh, Holoclean, although it has been commercialized, the open source still available uh, with a bunch of papers there. And Camino is the, um, is the newest um, contribution. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And I hope at least I intrigued you to look more into this and uh, and um, get excited about an old problem like data cleaning. Thank you very much, Ihab, for this very inspiring and very uh, interesting talk. And uh, so we are now open uh, for questions. Um, if you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and just speak out or you can type in the chat area. Any questions? Yeah, so I so so I have quite a few questions, but maybe I can ask the first one and to see whether there's some question from the audience. I can uh, ask others. So there's a there's a panel at Sigma this year talking about their automating data preparation and the, the, the people in the panelists they have different opinion. But on your this slide to mention automating data cleaning is uh, something that you will really want to work on in the future. I just uh, want to see that, can, we, can you give us a clear definition on what you mean by automating data cleaning? And do you really think that this is something that we can achieve in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean obviously I was in that panel, Jinan, and I was the, um, yeah. my, my job there was to be the, you know, the, the crazy one that says, yes, it can be automated uh, just to make it controversial. But I really mean here is, you know, um, automate, automating data cleaning for me uh, doesn't mean, and, I, and in, in my head, uh, having a self-serve solution, a complete self-turnkey self-serve solution is, is beyond automation. Uh, automation doesn't mean no involvement, doesn't mean that it's self-serve and it has zero interaction with human. Um, I think the more um, humble definition is something around allowing enough tooling and generating enough repeatable building blocks 
that uh, uh, practitioners and auto ML people and, and machine learning uh, um, engineers and data scientists at least can use it. It's, it's a little bit embarrassing that for outlier detection, for example, uh, we don't have uh, something that, that's kind of standard or, or at least a tool in which it can just build a model in the data and give you some suggestion what's going on. So I feel that treating all data cleaning as just a big hairy ball of ETL doesn't help us understand the problem correctly. So Holoclean is just a step into automation. It just build a model on the data and try to, create, to get you suggestion. The output of this should feed into another action or in another you know, data op that probably can take this and send it to your QA people to, to tell you what's not and you know, what's right and what's not. Uh, but now you have another box that does, for example, mining. Uh, and you know, we have, you know, Genpei has, has been leading this community and you can do a lot of, you know, mining constraints and soft constraints, but now you can put it, automate that mining and you don't have to believe it all. Now you can deal with it in a soft way, feed it into um, uh, kind of a model that try to understand the data. So I think I mean more repeat, repeatable ML ops that support the data cleaning is, uh, is an interesting direction as opposed to try to find the alpha and omega system that will solve data cleaning once and for all, because you know, it's just a hard problem and very diverse. Does that make sense to you? Still not convinced. Which, yeah. which, which side are you in this panel? Uh, uh, I, I, I think the, that's just my personal opinion. I think that the first I agree that data cleaning is not a single problem. It has too many problems. And I think we can define those small problems first. And for some problem, it's, it's, it can be easily automated using some rules. But for some problem, it's very hard, like the error detection or data preparing where machine learning can help. Um, but bringing machine learning could also have some issue about the transparency, where it gave you a clean data, but you don't know why it's clean in that way which means that using the downstream machine learning model could help you to decide whether you automated it. data cleaning is a good I, I agree. In fact, some of our customers were banks and bank in European country, a specific European country in which the regulations are that, you know, extremely high. Um, and they still use this, uh, but used it in a very creative way. They didn't use it to actually predict anything automatically. They use it to see if the prediction is different than the rule-based uh, system. And when there is a discrepancy, they put a red flag and to put more priority of setting it, of, se uh, of sending it to their uh, QA engineers uh, and auditors. So they used, you know, they reused this machine that gives them yet another signal in understanding that all what, all, all, all what they interpreted from this is there is a machine learning model that took this data and predicted that something is wrong. In this case, I don't really need to understand something's wrong or not. I'm gonna send it to a human regardless. And I say, look at this, because at least it didn't pass a single test, which is you know, a case in which I'm gonna go for errors. I don't need to invest a lot in explainability and interpretability of these results. But we have other people like the, you know, in the, in the insurance company and, and some of our Tamer customers, they insist on seeing the model. In fact, we need to distill the model or project it into a decision tree such that they can say, you know, GNN and Ehab are the same because they agree on address and they agree on zip code and they disagree on this. And that was important for them uh, to justify for the consumer of this data. So, you know, based on these requirements, uh, I think there is a, enough smart people in this community to be able to kind of define that. We have enough range, but we need to think about this in a ops and data in, data out boxes, and in, you know, uh, invest in uh, repeating uh, exercises as opposed to everything is a piecemeal and everything is a start from scratch ETL. Cool. Yeah, uh, Oliver has one question. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. Does uh, Camino generate relational data uh, such as uh, multiple tables with foreign key constraints or single table data only? That's a great question. Current versions generate only a single table. Um, it doesn't generate um, 
uh, multiple tables and pretty much we do a lot of, even in Holoclean, the input to Holoclean is usually denormalized. So even if we have like, you know, departments and employees, we join them first and create a big table to generate context. It's interesting how to generate a schema uh, and, and learn from a schema, but at least the current version doesn't have it. It's a legitimate request though. Thank you. Of course. So, Jalan, do you have any further questions? Uh, yeah, I have another question uh, about the uh, Camino project. So, I'm, because another way to ensure the data uh, privacy or security is through the federated learning of federated database, which you can encrypt the data. I'm not sure uh, how is this project related to this federated database of federated learning. Well, Chang is definitely excited about that. He's, you know, he has a, you know, a paper of how to learn uh, function dependency in, um, you know, in, in multi, uh, uh, on encrypted data with multi-party, uh, secure multi-party computation, for example, and and so on. Uh, I am, ha I haven't seen uh, a working. Um, encrypted federated uh, analytics of you know or federated learning on encrypted data working in reality and oftentimes people just ship data and they would like to uh, go through privacy policy for it uh, just because you know erecting a, a working model federated learning on encrypted data is you know span uh, organizational boundaries and oftentimes uh, just get killed by logistically get killed not technically uh, so um, I think it's, you know, I'm not saying it's not working. I just didn't see an, an, an effective uh, way um, or adoption in industry for it. Uh, so that's why we pushed in another direction while we're still interested in, you know, I, I think Chung has a follow-up in learning denial constraint in a federated learning way or, and, and he had an earlier paper at APEX when he integrated, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, interacted with a data set behind the firewall as well. But um, we thought that what we really need is sharing private data around because that's what people do. Uh, and we just need to kind of uh, support them. Doesn't mean it's the only technique. It's a good question. Okay, maybe I can have a question. Uh, indeed, I want to ask this question uh, for a long time. <laughs> so just pretend you already uh, had uh, one glass of beer. So you are pretty successful in both academia and entrepreneurship. Um, can you share with us something, uh, your experience about uh, from the academia uh, point of view and also technical point of view and business point of view of your success in um, being a professor and also being an uh, entrepreneur? Well, it's, it's a hard question, Jinpei, because I think these are, you know, I'm, I'm definitely lucky with working with just talented people. So one of the biggest uh, advantage of working in academia that you're surrounded by people, most of them are smarter than you. And um, I was just fortunate that I have amazing students and collaborators who are world experts in what they're doing. So when I'm interested in a problem, uh, I don't have to solve it all by myself. That's, that's, that, that's the beauty of it. You'll have uh, amazing brains around you that I cannot afford to have to hire them as consultant interested in solving the same problem. So I think the team is number one. Um, in fact, uh, the biggest, the, the most useful thing about business I heard about uh, is there are uh, four reasons to succeed in business and technology is number five. Uh, and you know, it, it's really not important the problem that you're working on your algorithm. Uh, the team, the pain point and the need. So you need to solve a problem that at least somebody other than you care about. So if you solve it, somebody else other than you being happy with your paper will be happy and say, finally, you solved that problem. The more, the merrier. Uh, and that requires us talking to way more people. And I, I, I know everybody's saying that, but I, Chang asked me the same question. I told him, just go and read Gartner and read TechCrunch and you know what people spend money on and why it's a problem. Because uh, we like it or not, uh, you know, there are theoretical problems and, 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 and so on. But for practical problems, usually, somebody has to pay for it to be solved. 
So if you don't know what's important, go and see what people spend money on. And that's a good indication that it's a good problem to spend your energy on. So I think spending more time in the problem than the solution is the only advice I can come up with and surround yourself by smart people, share your success, share, you know, pitch up. You know, I always pitch problems to my colleagues, to my students. I always like pitch problem. How about we solve this? How about we solve that? And sometime, you know, one time they will believe you, they will get as excited about it as you are. And uh, if there is enough users, you will be intrigued to put it in people's hands. And if they are excited enough to pay you, you will know. In this case, it becomes a, it becomes a business. And then you, you seek advice. And I had a lot of help in the beginning, you know, in starting Tamer, I had a lot of advice from Mike Stonebreaker and Andy Palmer. And, and they, you know, I, I learned a lot from them how to start the business. So when I did inductive, I knew a few things. So I, you know, I, you don't have to start your own, the first one on your own. Just, you know, there are people that are better at this. So go and learn from them. So when I did uh, the second and, you know, I also consult. So I, I just, you know, spend time observing and uh, just getting excited about the problem. So if you need to check two teams, it's just problem and team. And then the rest doesn't matter. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any further questions? Okay. So uh, thank you again. This is a very inspiring talk and uh, we learned a lot from you. And hopefully after the pandemic, we can really have opportunities to you know, meet each other in person. Also uh, really can uh, invite you to visit SFU in person. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that would be a pleasure. So, you know, I, I'm gonna be probably moving soon to Seattle. So we'll be even close in the same time zone and I'll be happy to come and, and spend some time. Oh, great. Congratulations. Thank you so yeah. much for Absolutely. having me and thanks for the invitation. It was a pleasure talking to you all and um, hope you go and check out some data cleaning problems and it's not that bad. Yeah, <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, thank you all for bye. coming to this talk. Yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.